Welcome to week four of World Ocean Awareness Month. Today we're going to be talking about our favorite giant ocean mammal, which is whales. We're also going to be making a whale bird feeder that you can hang in your yard, and we're going to be talking about ways to save the ocean and our planet. The open sea is the huge expanse of ocean that is past the coastal areas and above the sea floor. The open ocean is so giant that it makes up 99% of the inhabitable space on Earth. Even though the open ocean is so vast, it is a hard place to live and only 10% of marine species can survive here. One animal that roams through the open ocean is the whale. Recordings of whale songs can be found in outer space. In 1977, gold records were placed on the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Among other nature sounds, the records included the song of a humpback whale. Blue whales are absolute whoppers. Clocking in at 98 feet long and 190 tons, the blue whale is the biggest animal to have existed ever. That includes dinosaurs. T-Rex may be the lizard king, but the blue whale deserves recognition as the animal king. The white whale of Moby Dick fame is actually real. Today, there are between three and four white whales roaming the ocean, the most famous of which is Migaloo. In 1991, Migaloo was first spotted and until 2011 was the only known white whale. Migaloo, which means white fella in a few aboriginal languages, is a male humpback who is hypopigmented, which is why he is so pale. Migaloo is well loved and has extra protections to ensure his safety. In fact, a boat getting within 500 meters of white whales results in a fine of over $16,000. Have you ever thought about how whales sleep? Observations of whales in the wild show two basic methods of sleeping. They either rest quietly in the water, vertically or horizontally, or sleep while swimming slowly next to another animal. Sperm whales were found to spend just under two hours of their day in these vertical sleeping positions near the surface of the water, napping in 10 to 15 minute increments. This suggests that they may be one of the world's least sleep dependent animals. What's more, whales in captivity have been found to use only half their brain while sleeping, a behavior scientists think could help them avoid predators, maintain social contact, control breathing, or continue swimming. Do you think you'd like to sleep standing up? It's been calculated that about 8 million metric tons of plastic waste enters the oceans every year, mostly through rivers carrying trash from the world's cities to the marine environment. So, what does 8 million metric tons of pollution look like? Well, imagine that every foot of coastline in the entire world is lined with five grocery bags stuffed with plastic. Hard to imagine, right? But unfortunately, this is the reality of our oceans. The trash entering our oceans is even becoming famous. Media headlines have focused on debris such as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Spanning the American West Coast all the way to Japan, this area of ocean trash soup is created when trash is trapped in the calm area between swirling ocean currents. Visible trash, like in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, is thought to represent just 1% of marine plastic. The exact whereabouts of the other 99% is unknown. Cleaning up the oceans is incredibly important. However, the bigger focus in our daily lives should be to stop plastic from entering the oceans in the first place. The less plastic we use and throw away, the less opportunity garbage patches have to grow. When you imagine the seafloor, do you think of a desolate stretch of sand broken up only by a few sea vents and the wayward crab? Well, unfortunately, this is not the case. Plastic pollution has invaded even the deepest parts of the ocean. Just this year, scientists have identified the highest level of microplastics, which are plastics that are smaller than one millimeter, ever recorded on the seafloor. The analysis of a sediment block brought up from the Italian part of the Mediterranean Sea, which was led by the University of Manchester, found up to 1.9 million plastic pieces per square meter of sediment. This increases the chance that the microplastics will be ingested by marine life. Plastic isn't the only pollution issue affecting our oceans. 
When you put clothing and food scraps into the trash, they have to go somewhere. Unfortunately, their final destination is in landfills, where they decompose. During the decomposition process, they produce landfill gas, which is a terrible mix of roughly 50% methane and 50% carbon dioxide. This mix is so terrible because both gases are known as greenhouse gases, the gases that contribute to global warming. Metropolitan areas like Atlanta have the infrastructure to trap these gases and use them as a resource. But landfills near smaller towns, rural areas, and poor areas are not equipped to deal with these gases and let them escape into the atmosphere. As the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere trap more energy from the sun, the oceans also absorb more heat, which results in an increase in sea surface temperature and rising sea levels. This directly threatens ocean life, as can be seen by the melting polar ice caps. A good way to combat these greenhouse gases is by composting, which we'll discuss a little later on in this video. But there is some good news. In 2020, Discover Magazine reported the discovery of a superhero caterpillar. These caterpillars, dubbed plastivores, are able to munch on plastic to essentially biodegrade it in a few hours instead of the hundreds of years it takes otherwise. Of course we want to keep new plastics out of the landfill, but these plastivores offer a very hopeful solution for what is already there. Today we're going to be making a whale bird feeder. The materials that we will need today is of course a plastic bottle. I am using this type of bottle because it's easier to cut with scissors, but you could use a two liter bottle or you know another type of plastic. You may just need help cutting it. And speaking of cutting, we will also need some scissors. We will need some blue paint, a paintbrush of some kind. We will need a black marker, a thin stick, we could use a twig from the yard or a craft stick. You will need some white school glue, need some googly eyes, but don't worry if you don't have googly eyes, you can draw on the eyes with a marker, some bird seed in a cup, some strong tape, you will need some cardboard such as from a cereal box, a piece of paper, and last but not least, you will want to use some newspaper because everyone gets messy. Oops, forgot the string. All right, the first thing that we want to do is mark off where we want to put our stick. So about a little bit of the way up from the bottle. Make a nice hole here. And then on the other side, make another hole. And then a little up from that one, you want to make a rough circle. Doesn't have to be perfect. And then again, on the other side. All right, and then taking our scissors, you can squish the bottle. You may want to take the lid off for it. And you can begin the process of cutting. We're going to pour all that out. All right, and for the holes for the stick, those don't have to be very big, so you can just make a very small cut where your dots are. Now it's time to paint our bottle. We really only want to do from just above where the feeder hole will be up. The reason for that is because if the birds can't see the bird feed, the bird seeds, they won't want to eat it. So we're only going to paint just the top part here. So we've got our paint, we've got our brush, and now we're going to begin our process of painting. And this is how he would look when he's finished with the paint and now you want to set him to the side and let him dry. Now we're going to make our whale tail. So we're going to take the, our piece of paper, we're going to fold it roughly in half. 
All right, and then make a short line and then just be as big and bold with that tail as you want. All right, and once that is done, we can cut him out. And there he is. All right, and now I've cut out a rectangular piece of cardboard from our Cheerios box. And you can take the pattern that you've made. You can either tape it down and cut around it, or you can trace around it. I'm gonna trace. And remember, it doesn't have to be perfect. I'm sure the whales wouldn't mind. They are general giants after all. And now you can cut out the cardboard of the whale tail. And you want to paint it too, paint it blue. Now we are ready to take our googly eyes and glue it onto our completely dry bottle. Oh. Okay, just put some glue on these googly eyes. And just put them where you think they will fit the best. You can also use tape for this step in case glue is not something that you want to work with or if it doesn't stick properly. Now that his eyes are secure, we can go on to our further steps. The first step is going to be to pour in some of our bird seed. And you just kind of cup it a little so that way when you're pouring, you can get all of those seeds, or most of them at least, into the cup, into your bottle with no spilling. If you want to, you can keep your newspaper from the previous painting part, so that way you can, you know, do a little bit easier of cleanup. All right, and then after that, we're going to take our craft stick, and we can push it through the holes that we made earlier with our scissors. Make sure the holes are fairly small, fairly small. And then we're going to attach our string. We're going to tie it here in a loop. I actually pre-tied it a little bit, but you can just make sure it's nice and snug there and then put our lid back on. The last step is going to be to attach our painted whale tail. You can actually do this step before adding your bird seed if you feel like that will be messy. I've already pre-cut some tape. So I'm just gonna put some tape here on either side. And then we stick it on the bottom. You can use whatever color tape you have or any actual way that you want to attach this tail, whether you want to hot glue it or use some tape. And now, here is our whale bird feeder. This is the completed whale bird feeder. I did add a little mouth little smile so that he looks very happy because he's happy to be feeding the birds. You can hang this from a tree or from your porch if you have a hook 
or wherever you feel as though birds will be visiting. Hi, I'm Laura Hernandez, the founder of Gwinnett Recycles, and today we're going to talk about how and why it's so important and so critical to compost at home. We're going to learn a lot today. Anytime I'm out in the community talking trash, I'm always fond of reminding that there is a reason that the phrase is reduce, reuse, recycle. It's in priority order. When it comes to food waste, reduce, reuse, compost is the name of the game. What that means is that we should always look out for opportunities to cut down on how much excess food we have that we don't eat, give what we can to hungry people or animals, and then think about composting what's left over. Remember, as great as it is, composting is a disposal method, so it's a last resort. Reducing food waste can be hard sometimes, but with practice and some useful tools, we can get good at it. SaveTheFood.com and StopFoodWaste.org both have great tips and resources to help you buy what you need and eat what you buy. An app called Olio lets you list food that you want to give away and connect with neighbors who want to pick it up. And while there doesn't seem to be one single site I can direct you to to find food donation opportunities throughout Gwinnett, it's worth searching locally in your town to see how you can help feed the hungry in your community. With that said, when it comes time to dispose of food or yard waste, composting is amazing. In a sense, it's magical. It's a controlled breakdown of organic waste that can turn the mixture that you see on the left side of the bin there, or that was on our title slide, into the nutrient-rich soil amendment pictured on the right within a short span of time. There are a lot of ways to compost, and all of them provide the perfect conditions of moisture, air, and heat for soil microbes like bacteria, protozoa, and fungi to feast on organic material. Another magical part of compost as it's breaking down is that if you're doing it right, it doesn't actually smell bad. All that old food waste decomposes quickly and smells just like earthy, regular soil. It's also worthwhile. First, compost is great for gardens and healthy soils. It's called gardening gold. Second, it's critical for protecting the environment. A large portion of our home waste stream in America and in Gwinnett is compostable waste. When compostable waste ends up in a landfill, it emits methane, a greenhouse gas that is much more potent than carbon dioxide in trapping heat within our atmosphere. Landfills account for about 34% of all methane emissions in the U.S., meaning that all the compostable stuff you or I has ever tossed in the trash is increasing our carbon footprint. Rather than generating methane, the composting process converts organic material into stable soil carbon while retaining water and nutrients of the original waste material. The result is carbon sequestration, so it's not escaping as emissions and heating up our planet, as well as production of a valuable natural fertilizer. Composting is easy. There are many composting solutions, pretty much one for virtually all situations, and many composting approaches are low maintenance or no maintenance. And finally, composting is something you can start anytime. Unlike recycling, whose markets ebb and flow or the lists of accepted materials might change, composting is just totally within your power. You don't have to wait for a hauling service to become available or for your neighbors to join in. To just do it yourself and start making a positive difference for the planet immediately. The only reason I ever hear people say to not bother composting is actually a myth that organic waste in a landfill breaks back down to soil just like it does in a compost pile. They might say, oh, well, that banana peel I just tossed in the trash is going to be dirt again in a few weeks. Unfortunately, that's really not the case. Landfills are kind of like Vegas. What happens there stays there. This thick plastic lining that's laid at the bottom and the sides of a landfill so that there's minimal leakage of the trash into groundwater, plus just the airtight nature of a landfill that blocks sunlight, oxygen, and microbes, basically essentially mummifies our waste. Compost is the way to return organic waste to the soil, not through a landfill. So what goes into your compost? The big category is any non-animal food scraps, like potato peels, lettuce, banana peels, coffee grounds, avocado skins, food that isn't suitable for eating anymore, maybe it's gone a little bit bad or too mushy, etc. Try to leave out non-compostable elements like the plastic stickers on fruits and veggies and the metal staples in tea bags. You can technically compost food scraps that contain animal products, but they require more care. Food scraps with trace amounts of eggs, such as eggshells, dairy, or fats can be attractive to nighttime scavengers. 
If your compost bin locks, then you're not going to have any issues with that. But if you keep an open compost bin, you may want to keep those kinds of items out of it. Meat and bones should be avoided altogether. Not only do they carry the risk of disease, they're also very attractive to a wide variety of undesirable animals. Even in a securely locked compost bin, these items are enticing enough that an animal may try to damage your compost bin to get at them. It's best to throw these items in the trash rather than use them in your compost. Other items that are compostable are old herbs and spices, leaves from um, house plants or outdoor plants, grass and plant clippings, holiday greenery from wreaths and swags, Halloween pumpkins at the end of the season, pine needles, sawdust, wood chips, shredded non-glossy paper like printer paper, and cardboard. Compost is actually, this is a great use for the greasy part of the pizza box that is not recyclable because it could damage the, the creation of the new recycled paper. But if you shred that cardboard up, you can put it into your compost bin. That's a great way to divert it. These materials fall into two basic categories, greens and browns, that you want to add to your bin. Greens are the nitrogen-rich additions to your compost pile. These tend to have lots of moisture, break down quickly, and provide a quick burst of heat to your pile. While we call them greens, technically any plant matter will work here. So things like coffee grounds are brown and pumpkins are orange, but they're both rich in nitrogen, so they are considered greens for composting purposes. Browns are the carbon-rich materials that add aeration to the pile and structure to your compost. They break down a lot more slowly, so it's a good idea to chop them up pretty small. In, a, in general, you should have about four times as many browns as greens. That is great for keeping odor down and making it so it really doesn't smell anything other than really rich dirt. For super fast compost, pay strict attention to those proportions. And if your goal is simply to avoid sending organic waste to the landfill and the compost is kind of an afterthought, then you don't need to worry about it as much. If your bin gets wet and smelly, add more browns and cut back on the greens for a while, then give it a turn. If the contents of your bin aren't breaking down, add some greens, turn it, and it should start turning back into beautiful, rich compost again. Now, essentially, we're going to take those ingredients and we're going to cook our compost. What compost does is it decomposes, and it does that fastest between about 120 and 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So anything that you can do to increase the heat is going to cook your compost faster. Ways that you can do this are to chop and shred larger items, which makes it easier for bacteria to break them down. So use that lawnmower to run them over leaves and other garden materials, and take, take your scissors to the cardboard to break it down. Make sure to turn it. Turn, turn, turn. Um, that also increases the heat when you take a, a rake or something to your outdoor pile, for instance, and aerate it. Give your compost heap a big meal. Collect all your organic waste over a couple days and add it in one big batch. And keep your compost pile at least partly in the sun because the heat from the sun will speed up the process. So there are a lot of compost methods out there and sometimes it can be hard to pick the one that's best for you. So I wanna point you in the right direction that you can go and do more research into getting started. If you wanna keep your compost set up indoors, if that's your priority because maybe you don't have a backyard, consider a Bokashi composting method or worm composting. Those are both very small scale solutions that can just be put underneath a kitchen sink. If you want to minimize pests and odors and just avoid all that risk, consider worm composting or a compost tumbler that you keep the right balance of greens and browns in. If you want an ultra low maintenance and free option, consider a compost heap, which is basically just a big pile in the backyard, trench or pit composting, which is basically a big hole in the, or a little hole in the backyard that you put the stuff into, or check with a neighbor who has compost or a community garden to see if you can drop off your materials with them. That is also sometimes a good option. If you want to harvest mature compost ASAP, plan to use it in your garden. Consider worm composting, which is considered a, a pretty quick method. Three bin composting, where you're moving the material along the process and you end up with a, a pile that is just finished compost ready to use. Or a dual compost tumbler. This allows you to put fresh material on one side while you're moving the more mature material to another side to harvest more quickly. That's all we've got today. Remember, Gwinnett Recycles is a citizen volunteer organization, so we always need more volunteers to help our mission of educating and engaging the citizens of Gwinnett around recycling and waste reduction. So check out our website, GwinnettRecycles.com, for opportunities to get involved and volunteer. 
Be sure to reduce, reuse, recycle, compost, and spread the word to your neighbors. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll talk to you soon. Want to learn more about whales? Check out some additional reading on whales, composting, and recycling with these titles that are available in our libraries. Additionally, you can visit the Gwinnett County Public Library's digital resource, Britannica Online School Edition, and search for whales to find out lots of cool facts about these fascinating marine creatures. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to earn a World Ocean Awareness Month badge in our summer reading through Beanstack.